Good afternoon to everybody from a very uh, sunny um, Roman afternoon. I, I welcome uh, all of you. Um, and I hope that we will have a, a very interesting seminar for the last uh, 90 minutes. Uh, the title is um, Human Rights and Solidarity in Europe Today. Uh, this event is uh, meant um, to be a sort of conclusion of the Italian presidency to the Council of Europe. Of course, the presidency is already over and now our Irish friends are taking over this task, but we uh, thought that uh, it might be useful just to revamp uh, uh, certain points and certain aspects which were, I think, uh, very well uh, touched upon in our six months uh, in the April. I would like uh, uh, briefly to uh, present um, our panel. We will have uh, two uh, short opening remarks by Stefano Schiavo, who is the director of the School of International Studies, Università di Trento, and by Daniele Frigeri, who is the director of uh, CESPI here in Rome. Those interventions will be followed by two more uh, constructed ones, uh, uh, two speeches. Uh, one of them will be delivered by Gianluca Alberini, who is the principal director for the Human Nations and Human Rights uh, at the Italian Foreign Ministry, and by Daniela Ferrari of uh, the project School Beyond Regions and Borders. And of course, uh, the last uh, and more, most important um, in, um, speech will be that of uh, Mr. Tiny Fox, Tiny Fox, uh, who is the president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the um, Council of Europe. Once more, um, welcome to all of you. Uh, briefly to myself, I am Marco Marsilli, a former uh, permanent representative in Strasbourg and uh, actually a scientific counselor at the CESP. So without uh, any other, other delay, I will uh, ask uh, Mr. Schiavo uh, to be uh, to take the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Marsili, and uh, welcome all of you. And I, let me just spend a few words to thank uh, my colleague uh, Michele Nicoletti for putting together uh, this and, and uh, having the school participating in this project. It's, we are very happy to be part of the project. We are very thankful also to CESPI for the collaboration. It's an excellent way, it's an excellent example of this collaboration by the two institutions. It's an important part of our outreach activities, uh, both for the topics uh, so that lie at the intersection of human rights and Europe, that are two of the main uh, research topics here at the School of International Studies, which is a, a multidisciplinary a center of the University of Trento, uh, devoted, as the name suggests, to a European and international studies. Um, but also because it allows us to reach out to a younger generation of students, younger than those that we normally have here at the school. Uh, and so it sort of complements uh, uh, the, the outreach that we have on those important topics that speak about, especially in, in the current circumstances that, that speak about uh, global citizenship and European citizenship. And we do think it's very important to speak to the, young, the younger generations about this. And so again, uh, thanks everybody for being here and especially to President Cox for uh, making himself available to talk to us. Thank you very much, uh, Director Schiavo, for your words. And uh, Daniele, Jerry is the next uh, the line. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to everybody. And thank you to the panelists, to Mr. Cox, uh, Daniela Ferrari, Gianluca Berini, uh, Stefano Schiavo, and Marco Marsili, uh, and all the audience that, uh, that uh, is connected. Uh, thank you to the School of International Studies uh, of uh, Trento. Uh, I agree the, the partnership in this uh, in these fields are strategic, you know, uh, particularly in this moment, because uh, we, we need uh, to um, reinforce you know, 
the, the, the ability to uh, to understand what is going on. Uh, for me, it's, it's, a, it's an honor uh, to, open, to, to open this seminar uh, and uh, that follow the conclusion of the Italian presidency of the Council of Europe. Uh, I think uh, one of the most difficult in the history of this institution. Uh, the um, seminar of today concludes also uh, a project carried out by CESPI, by the Human Rights Observatory of CESPI, with the support of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, which had the task to accompany the Italian presidency, uh, provide analysis and opening a, a dialogue with the expert and the representative of uh, civil society. Uh, the observatory since uh, 2019 uh, has been doing uh, an important intensive work. Uh, please let me thank uh, uh, Professor Nicoletti, who coordinates the observatory, the researcher, Mariana and Francesco, and all the expert um, and the authoritative representative of civil society uh, who have helped our, our job uh, and su support our effort. Uh, Europe is experiencing a moment of uh, dramatic change, a change whose evolution and conclusion is difficult to, to predict. The invasion of Ukraine is uh, certainly the most alarming event, but uh, in recent years uh, there has been uh, several signs of uh, impoverishment of the dimension of human rights and the rule of law in many of the countries of the Council, the Council of Europe. Uh, complicit uh, with the pan pandemic. Uh, also, civil society uh, itself is experiencing uh, um, a difficult moment in defense of human rights. Uh, so the European Convention of Euro uh, Human Rights, uh, the funding values of democracy, of freedom, of the pan-European dialogue, that are the roots of the Council of Europe are being uh, um, challenged. Uh, dispersion of Russia, uh, of course, uh, uh, an uh, inevitable step after the uh, aggression against uh, Ukraine was an important chesura that will uh, uh, leave a mark. Uh, the Council have stated that uh, he wants to maintain a dialogue and support uh, the Russian civil society who keeps working in defense of uh, human rights. How to do this uh, is all to understood and built. Uh, but it is um, um, particularly the, the current situation uh, uh, that I think uh, calls for strengthening uh, the role of the, the Council of Europe and its, its institution, uh, its uh, instruments of dialogue, uh, monitoring, uh, and uh, uh, sanction. Uh, during the, this project, we also produced a paper that presented uh, some of the challenges with, uh, that the Council uh, is facing. Uh, some are all, uh, elder, um, the European Social Charter, uh, Center to Solidarity and the Fight uh, Against Inequality, and some, some ones that are I mean, news, no? new uh, artificial intelligence and uh, all the issue of uh, environment. Um, the key point uh, um, is strengthening the cooperation uh, between the European Union and the Council of Europe. First, uh, the new accession to the Convention of Human Rights. I think that is one of the uh, uh, central points in order to put human rights back at the center of the European agenda and playing together with the Council, a driving and leading role in the development of uh, human rights all over the world. Uh, all of this, all this requires uh, um, uh, visibility and greater awareness among the public opinion also about the role, the function, and the, the action of the uh, Council of Europe. So uh, I just uh, uh, give just, just a few uh, reflections uh, to start our work. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Daniele, for your introduction and uh, thank to both of you um, Daniele and uh, Areto Schiavo for having outlined very uh, shortly but also very effectively the priorities uh, 
of um, associations or foundation of uh, entities like uh, CESPI and uh, the School of International Studies in uh, Trento, uh, which are uh, very much engaged in the defense and the promotion of items such uh, human rights, uh, rule of law, uh, the culture of peace, um, items uh, of which uh, uh, today we, we feel uh, especially uh, the importance and uh, the relevance. Uh, I see that uh, President Nicoletti is connected with us and I would like also to, to welcome his presence. Since he is a little bit, uh, I would say the connection between, uh, between Chespi and the International, School, International Study School of Trento. And uh, of course uh, this, uh, I think as far as I can judge is a very good, uh, very good marriage. And we have today, one more proof of it. Okay, having said that, I would like now to introduce uh, uh, Mr. Gianluca Alberini, my former colleague uh, at the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Principal Director for the United Nations and Human Rights. Gianluca, the word is yours. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Marsili, and uh, hello everybody, President Cox, Professor Schiavo, Director Frigeri, everybody. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm very happy to uh, share with you some considerations on our very recent presidency of the Council of, the Council of Europe. Uh, I'm the director for United Nations and Human Rights and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, but I am also in charge of, of the Council of Europe and I was involved in the preparation of our presidency and uh, carrying out uh, um, all the, the the action that was uh, was needed and, and required, and, and 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 you will see that that we took uh, we think quite a lot of actions and and, and initiatives. Um, so I, I will try to to give you some some highlights, uh, starting from the consideration that that this is the eighth time that Italy was called to to lead the, the Council of Europe. Uh, since the, uh, the creation of the Council of Europe, Italy was one of the founding uh, members in 1949. Our presidency uh, lasted from uh, November last year, November 2021, and finished uh, uh, a few days ago, May 20th, uh, uh, in, in Turin, where we had the ministerial meeting, the, the Minister uh, of Foreign Affairs of the uh, participating countries, uh, uh, met in Turin, and we handed over the uh, the presidency to our uh, Irish friends. Um, we took this this commitment, uh, which comes once in a while. Last time it was actually twenty years ago. So uh, we felt the, the sense of responsibility uh, to carry the the, the work uh, during these six months, uh, and we were uh, aware of the opportunities and challenges. And we had quite a few challenges. Um, we intended to carry out our presidency as uh, inclusive, uh, participatory, result-oriented, uh, with the goal to preserve the uh, credibility of the organization, so to preserve the, the, the rules, the functioning of the organization, uh, while uh, enhancing uh, the, the, the goals, the, the, the implementation of the goals of the organization that are the protection of human rights, uh, democracy, and, and rule of law. Um, uh, against this uh, backdrop, uh, we had some uh, unexpected uh, events, unexpected and very, and very unfortunate. And uh, it was already mentioned. Uh, um, we were affected by the, the dramatic events uh, that took place in Ukraine, the Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine. So uh, an aggression, uh, a military aggression by uh, one um, member state against another uh, member state. Um, it was the, for the first time in the history of the organization, we had to take, uh, to take action, uh, a very strong action uh, uh, in the, uh, the Committee of Ministers, which is the uh, deciding the, the body of the, uh, of the organization, um, took the, the, the decision to, uh, to seize the membership uh, of the Russian, the Russian Federation. 
and, and I have to also to, to thank the president uh, of the assembly Cox for, for, for the very good cooperation that took place uh, among the, the, the three uh, branches of the Council of Europe. So the parliamentary assembly, the Council of Ministers that we were chairing as Italy and also the, the secretariat. Uh, thanks to the uh, like-mindedness and, and, and swift action uh, we were able to take this, this decision and, and I believe that nobody can question the righteousness of, of the decision. It, it was the only possible response in view uh, of the gravity of the facts uh, and the, the, the flagrant violation of the, of the statute of the Council of Europe by, uh, by the, Russian, the Russian Federation. Um, Adopting the decision to exclude Russia uh, actually uh, meant to uh, show firm determination to stand by, by the principles, by the founding principles uh, of the Council of Europe and, and to pursue an ambitious approach towards human rights, democracy and rule of law. Um, that said, it is true that now the Council of Europe has a, a little bit to reconsider, uh, well, first to fully appraise what are the effects and consequences uh, from the uh, arising from the cessation of the Russian uh, Federation from, from the membership. Um, and uh, this process will take some time. We have started it in, in Turin. Uh, the ministers has, has, have had discussions on, on what will be the, the future, because the horizon of, of the creators of, of the fathers, uh, founding fathers of the Council of Europe was the European continent. Well, now uh, we have an important uh, part of the continent, uh, the Russian Federation that seems to be to be member. So we, we will have to, uh, to appraise what this uh, entails in terms of program projects uh, uh, priorities and, and, and as I said, this uh, process started and, and, and will continue in uh, in the following in the following months. Um, so, despite this uh, unforeseen event, we uh, nonetheless managed to carry out, let's say, the ordinary program. Uh, so, the crisis uh, uh, was a fundamental. Uh, Russian aggression was a fundamental uh, episode uh, in the life uh, of the Council of Europe, but still the Council of Europe has to continue, had to continue, and is continuing to pursue the, its, its goals. Um, we organized our presidency uh, around three main uh, themes. We tried to, uh, to, to organize it, uh, all the 60 events that we carried out uh, around three main themes. The first one was to uh, recommit to our shared principles and, and values. The second was uh, uh, to uh, enhance women's empowerment and rights uh, of the children and adolescents. Um, and the third was to uh, build a people-centered future. Uh, let me briefly remind some uh, uh, of the progress that we achieved in these in these fields recommitting to our shared principle and, and values we as i said uh, as italy we wanted to revitalize the, the values at the core of the council of europe uh, supporting cooperation among uh, among member states in, in several fields uh, for instance health uh, uh, we were just uh, still not out still in, in the pandemic uh, the, the covid uh, virus had a, a huge impact on our national health systems and uh, it has also been an opportunity to more to move forward a more resilient and, and inclusive uh, healthcare system while preserving uh, uh, individual rights there's always this this very important issue issue with, with health um, social rights it's another area that, where we try to advance uh, the, the cooperation among uh, member states, uh, social rights are a key aspect of the European construction. 
uh, we strengthened, uh, we contribute to the efforts to strengthen the social charter by simplifying the monitoring procedures and uh, fostering a more regular dialogue with governments. Another area where we uh, gave particular, uh, uh, we put a particular effort is the cultural heritage. Yes, of course, as Italy, we, we cannot uh, avoid uh, doing cultural um, things, programs, uh, uh, but we believe that the culture is, a, is, a, is an outstanding tool to promote dialogue and social in inclusion uh, for a democratic and pluralistic uh, European identity. Um, we organized in Strasbourg uh, for the first time since 2013 uh, a conference of the ministers of culture of the Council of Europe uh, that gave a, a a strong impulse in, in, in that direction. We also promoted uh, intercultural and interreligious dialogue, uh, which is uh, fundamental to encourage uh, not only good, effective neighborhood policies, uh, but also to, to improve the Council of Europe uh, achievement, uh, achievements uh, in, in protecting human rights, democracy, and, uh, and, rule, of, and rule of law. Uh, in Strasbourg, we organized an international conference on interreligious inter dialogue on religious peace uh, and religion and human rights. And uh, uh, the Strasbourg principles uh, were presented a set of fundamental principles for interreligious dialogue, which will form the basis for future work of the organization. The second area uh, where we uh, that, that we organize is the uh, women's empowerment and, and rights of, of, of the children, uh, which are uh, vulnerable categories that were affected by the, the pandemic. Um, women and children use in general participation in economic and social recovery processes is fundamental uh, also to achieve its uh, uh, sustainability and, and and to ensure inclusiveness uh, at a more general level. Um, we organized a high level conference on uh, the work life balance uh, for women, uh, as, uh, uh, the, the, the issue of, of, of women's empowerment and promoting gender equality um, uh, as, a big, as a big impact. I mean, the, the, the work life uh, balance, we call it styling, professional, and, and private. Uh, and, and private, private lives. Another uh, important event uh, was the launch of the, Euro, the Council of Europe uh, strategy on the rights of children and adolescents for the years 2022, 2027. Um, the strategy outlines the goals and priorities of the Council of Europe and its member states to protect the rights of the children and make these rights a reality for everybody through six priority areas that I will not mention now. Um, we also um, held in Turin uh, uh, another important event for, for the youth uh, in cooperation with the Council of Europe, the City of Turin, European Youth Forum, the National Youth Council of Italy, um, an event focused uh, on the five-year review of the implementation of the Charter on Education for Democratic Citizenship and Human Rights Education. The third area is uh, the people-centered future. Uh, what do we mean by, by that? I mean, we wanted to keep uh, a forward-looking attitude uh, of the Council of Europe, uh, looking at the human being, uh, as the goal in improving the human being welfare through better implementation of democracy, human rights, and rule of law. Looking at technologies and science, making sure that they are put at the service of people's needs in full respect of human dignity and inalienable rights of the person. So we promoted the, the safe use uh, of internet, uh, for instance, and uh, particularly building on previous chairmanship, uh, uh, we uh, held uh, a high level conference on the impact of artificial intelligence on human rights, democracy and the rule of law. 
here in Rome. Uh, the conference uh, was followed by uh, also a meeting of the committee uh, of the Council of Europe reports on artificial intelligence, uh, which was mandated by the ministers in Turing to elaborate a legally binding instrument on the development, design, and application of artificial intelligence uh, based on the Council of Europe standards on human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, and conducive to innovation. Um, crime, uh, another uh, topic that we tackled uh, based on the people-centered vision of the future, uh, the, uh, the function of punishment of crimes, uh, uh, we held conferences uh, uh, looking at ways of how punishment of crimes could be not only a moment of rehabilitation uh, of the offender, but also of restoration for the victim, the, the restorative justice. It's quite the innovative uh, the concept for, for many countries, not for all, but for many countries in the Council of Europe. Um, and uh, we also had a conference uh, of the prosecutors uh, of the member states of the Council of Europe uh, uh, reflecting on the independence and accountability of, of prosecutors. Uh, we, we had a very important conference in, uh, uh, in Palermo. And uh, also it's worth recalling the second additional protocol to the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime that was opened for, for signature uh, in Strasbourg during, uh, during our presidency. So I gave you a lot of data, a, a lot of events, but I wanted to highlight uh, how the Council of Europe uh, uh, during our uh, presidency, but not only because of it, but because of the collective work of all the 46 states of, of, of the Parliamentary Assembly, uh, of the Secretariat, uh, is uh, tackling uh, key issues in the life of the European uh, citizens, of the citizens of, of the Council of Europe, uh, which are not always very aware of, of what the Council of Europe is doing, and uh, I will conclude uh, showing you uh, uh, publication. I hope you can see it. I have it, the French and English uh, version. It's a book for uh, children that we have pu published uh, of famous uh, character uh, children fiction. It's called Geronimo Stilton, which has been quite, quite, quite successful to, to explain to children in Europe uh, what is the Council of Europe and what they can expect from the Council of Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gianluca, for your comprehensive report on the semester of Italian presidency. I think that um, uh, your um, explanation, your uh, report shows once more how much uh, um, Italy uh, did, I think, in uh, this um, semester. I think, uh, um, as you say, that um, um, chairmanships, presidencies of, uh, in Strasbourg occur uh, in 20 years' time, more or less. So you, you took a real advantage of your, of your, of your spell. Uh, and I think, uh, as I said before, I'm a little bit perhaps uh, suspect of, uh, let's say, not being 100% objective in, considering in, uh, an Italian uh, achievement, but I think that um, also from um, international sources, uh, the uh, capacity of Italy to um, uh, move on um, both, uh, I would say, um, the program which had been established before, before the effects of uh, February 24th, which was a program already quite um, quite important, quite comprehensive, because you have mentioned healthcare, you have mentioned the uh, social charter, um, making it more straightforward and more also easy to um, to to adapt. Um, of course, the um, artificial intelligence issue, which was very hard, very much um, important in. The uh, in Strasbourg, I would say also the uh, empowerment of uh, women and the respect and the defense of the rights of children. I mean, uh, that is already uh, per se a very comprehensive uh, 
bulk of work. If on top of it, you add something with, um, which was totally unprecedented, unprecedented in Europe, uh, in the um, brutal uh, attack uh, by member state of Council of Europe to another member state on February 24th, and the consequences of this, um, of this uh, fact uh, also in terms of um, uh, internal debate and uh, very um, important internal de decisions. I think that really Italy uh, accomplished uh, a lot and uh, your also uh, personal, of course, contribution was very, was very valuable. If uh, I may um, very shortly have a recollection of my, of my time, in Strasbourg from 2016 to 2019. Uh, I remember how um, I was engaged in a sort of um, uh, opposite task. Uh, and of course, uh, President Nicoletti and the President can remember it very well. I mean, the fact that at the time Russia uh, was uh, deprived of uh, parliamentary representation at pace and how much uh, we did. Uh, in order to have uh, Russian parliamentarians back to the assembly because uh, we were of the opinion at the time. And I think we still uh, are now, uh, notwithstanding the difficulties, that uh, um, Russian contribution to the Council of Europe can be uh, very important. Of course, if I may say, not with the leadership that we have today, because um, Russia and Turkey on the other side represent two, uh, I would say, fundamental uh, um, countries in, inside the Council of Europe. And we uh, attach, at the time attached, and still, I think, attach much, much importance of having them on board for Turkey. It's, uh, uh, of course, a reality. Uh, for the time being, and for uh, Russia, I don't know, for the Russian Federation, of course, uh, we are in a sort of limbo, and uh, it's very hard to predict when it will happen again. So, um, once, once again, very uh, many congratulations for the Italian uh, semester of, of presidency. And uh, now I uh, pass uh, the floor to uh, Mrs. Daniela Ferrari. Please. Afternoon, afternoon. Uh, Ambassador Marsili, President Cox, and everybody, and uh, um, thank you for inviting us uh, to this uh, to this webinar. Um, I'm here to represent the project Schools Beyond Regions and Borders, and I would like to first uh, um, say that we are very grateful to the University of Trento in the person of uh, Professor Michele Nicoletti, the School of International Studies, and Chespi to give us the opportunity to uh, be um, to participate in this uh, high level um, debate. Thank you very much. And personally, um, I would also say like to say that I'm pleased and honored to uh, have the opportunity to um, uh, speak today on behalf of all those uh, wonderful people that work on this project, uh, on this wonderful project. Uh, first and foremost, uh, um, Professor Giuseppe Zordi, who first conceived and piloted the project a couple of years ago. And of course, again, um, Professor Michele Nicoletti, academic project head uh, from, for the University of Trento. So the, the project Schools Beyond uh, Regions and Borders is a civic education project that has been supported by the University of Trento and the region uh, Trentino Alto Adige, Zutirol since its inception. And uh, that has been supported also by several, um, uh, some of the oldest uh, insurance and business organizations on the territory. The main aim of the project is uh, uh, to offer secondary school pupils uh, from uh, various uh, European countries, the possibility, the opportunity to work together on different civic education projects, and, and in so doing, to build uh, their capacity uh, uh, to become active and, uh, and engaged European citizens. 
the schools that are mentioned in the project title are some secondary schools from several uh, European countries, um, for the time being Austria, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Spain, and in a few months, uh, France. Although um, in the future, we would like the project to move forward to a stage where other um, European countries will also be represented. Um, we all know that young people do not need to be guided in their encounter towards the other because they um, are they are they were born in a globalized world and uh, they uh, quite naturally uh, move across borders, move uh, beyond the national differences. They quite naturally create bonds across cultures. So what we, uh, what we offer them uh, are simply uh, opportunities to work, uh, to, to do so, to go beyond uh, borders and create bonds by working together uh, on different online projects, uh, focusing on uh, civic education and, and sometimes also um, organizing meetings where they can meet uh, in presence. Um, We've also had the, the chance and honor to join forces with another similar project uh, called uh, uh, the, the Jamoni project called uh, Enhancing Europe Citizenship Towards a More Social Europe, uh, once again headed by Professor Nicoletti and having the School of International Studies as uh, its main actor. So, uh, so basically what we also try to do is to make the most of these synergies with the academic community in, in an effort to, to create um, bridges between uh, the academics and the uh, secondary uh, school teachers and also between the academics and, and, the, and the students. Uh, in, in our specific case, uh, um, each month a, a lecture is, is held online in English by a university professor uh, on a specific umbrella topic and, uh, and each school then chooses uh, um, a specific seminar topic for more in-depth study in class and the relevant learning materials are later uh, made available on a, on a on, a, on, on our website that, uh, that was developed by the Fondazione Bruno Kessler for other schools to freely access them uh, uh, once the, the website will be um, made, uh, will be open to the public uh, in October, 2022. I must say that for us, it's, it's really encouraging to see how enthusiastically these, uh, the, the students uh, engage with the academics and give very free, precious feedback uh, that sometimes is good food, food for thought and uh, sometimes maybe more importantly is like a, a breath of fresh air for both teachers and, uh, and, and university professors alike. We are, of course, aware that, that our project can only give a small contribution to European citizenship and, and to the future of Europe, but we, we are convinced that um, promoting, promoting uh, activities that target uh, young people uh, and that give a voice to the young people uh, it is also one way and, and maybe it's, it's a good way. Uh, of building a stronger uh, and more united Europe. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the rest of the seminar. Thank you very much, um, Mrs. Ferrari, and um, um, thank you for your presentation. And I had um, uh, the pleasure of um, uh, meeting uh, participants of the project School, Schools Beyond Regional Borders quite recently in uh, Rovereto at uh, celebrating together the Fondazione Megalizzi and other entities, uh, the Schumann Day, uh, the Day of Europe, uh, the 9th of uh, May. And I must say, I was impressed by the level of knowledge uh, that uh, those young pupils had of, about uh, um, uh, 
uh, European institutions, uh, European um, way of life, uh, and also um, the proposals that they were able to, to bring together in order to have um, uh, institutions closer to citizens, closer to um, associations, closer to population. I think that um, they had already developed a very good uh, uh, knowledge of, um, of these issues. I know that one of your teacher, uh, Professor Zorzi, is uh, actually in Sarajevo. I would like also to, to greet him. Probably we will um, listen to him um, um, later on. But I think that um, um, this project uh, is very valuable and uh, very appreciable. And I hope that it will uh, be also continued in the, in the future because uh, it uh, represents uh, for sure um, added value, especially um, I would say uh, in countries which like uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina has not yet, um, a, I would say, a very, a very clear um, path uh, towards the European family before them. Uh, they know, of course, that, that, that it will occur, but uh, in uh, the amount of time and, and the way and what uh, what steps will be necessary uh, in order to join the European family is not 100% uh, sure. So your endeavor is even more valuable. And having said that, I would like to uh, pass the floor to the much expected intervention of uh, President Cox. I will... Uh, he, of course, is in no need of presentation, but let me uh, briefly uh, tell uh, also to our students uh, who are listening to us that um, uh, Mr. Cox uh, was, uh, is a member of the um, Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe since uh, uh, 2003, that he has uh, uh, laid for several years the uh, unified European labor group in the Assembly, is one of the groups uh, represented in the Parliamentary Assembly, and that he was uh, elected on the 24th of January of this year, President of the Parliamentary Assembly. I think uh, I, if my uh, let's say, uh, notes are not, are not wrong, he, he is the 34th uh, President of the uh, Parliamentary Assembly in Strasbourg. So, Mr. Cox. Thank you very much for, uh, uh, for inviting me to this seminar on human rights and solidarity in Europe today. Uh, I'll give you the greetings from the Dutch Senate, which is today meeting in its annual debate on the state of Europe. So uh, here, as well as in the, in, 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 in the, in the seminar, I'm dealing with the same uh, issues. Let me also first thank the organizers, the panelists, uh, the, the participants in Italy, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Germany, and even some in Strasbourg, I learned. And of course, special thanks to Ambassador Massili and to my good friend, Michele Nicoletti. This issue of uh, the seminar is of particular relevance for the future European architecture and the multilateral cooperation based on protection and promotion of the rule of law, human rights and democracy as a fundamental values for civilized national and international cooperation. Values that we want to protect and promote at the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, which I have the honor to preside. May I also use this opportunity to thank the Italian presidency of the Committee of Ministers with whom I cooperated very intensively especially in these challenging uh, times. Uh, I want to use the opportunity to congratulate Minister Di Maio and his staff, but also Ambassador Giacomelli in, in, in Strasbourg for the excellent work that was done by the Council of Europe under Italian presidency. And of course, I have I get to thank again the fact that the, the, your president, President Mattarella, who came to address our assembly in our last session, I asked him to say some wise words. I can uh, tell you he taught us a lot of wise words in his intervention uh, on the future of multilateralism in Europe and the role of the Council of Europe. So please allow me to share some older and newer thoughts 
that I have on this team, human rights and solidarity in Europe today and the role of the Council of Europe now and in the future. Uh, some of them are new, so I'm also using you, panelists and participants, as a, as, a, as a test. If you, at the end, conclude this man is ridiculous, do send a note to the Secretary General of the Council of Europe and she will take, uh, take action. But I want uh, to hear also your, your comments. As you know, human rights are officially guaranteed in Europe as almost all European states participate in Europe's oldest and broadest treaty organization founded in 1994, uh, the Council of Europe with Italy as one of its founding members, just as the Netherlands. Since then, almost all states in Europe have joined the organization, including former authoritarian states like Spain and Portugal, and since the end of the Cold War, the former communist states, including Russia and Ukraine. By doing so, they all have committed themselves with regard to their citizens to respect the human rights and freedoms formulated in the European Convention of Human Rights. This is a unique binding international convention which allows all European citizens to appeal to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg in case they feel uh, themselves violated in their fundamental rights and freedoms. The guidance given by the court verdicts has substantially improved the development of one legal sphere in member states and therewith in the whole of Europe. The enormous caseload of the Strasbourg courts, however, indicates that at the same time, that until today, far too many member states still commit themselves far too less to what they should guarantee to their citizens under the convention. And due to a recent series of crises, we witness in member states even an erosion of these rights and freedoms. So human rights are a great idea to civilize our societies and protect our citizens, as well as a stubborn challenge for authorities to fully commit themselves to their obligations towards their citizens. Since the 24th of February, many of the fundamental human rights and freedoms are brutally attacked in our member state, Ukraine, by an illegal Russian military invasion. Russia's unprovoked war of aggression against Ukraine, waged in open defiance of international law, has done enormous harm to the international order set up after the end of the Second World War and the end of the Cold War and put the existing European multilateral architecture at great risk. Half March, it was already referred to, our parliamentary assembly concluded therefore unanimously that the Council of Europe membership of the Russian Federation should come to an end. Starting a war of aggression against your neighbors in spite of your solemn commitment to pursue peace means crossing a red line with the Council of Europe and therefore, therefore means there is no longer place for you in the Council of Europe. Having heard the Assembly's opinion, the Committee of Ministers, led by Minister Di Maio and Ambassador Giacomelli, uh, and uh, representing the intergovernmental part of our organization, decided only one day after the Assembly's opinion to indeed and immediately end Russia's membership. No other international organization did act so quickly and decisively. I'm sad that we had to do it. I'm glad that we did dare to do it, showing that membership of the Council of Europe and European multilateralism is not for free. Since then, however, the military aggression of the Russian Federation continues. Due to this devastating destruction, tens of thousands have been killed, injured, maltreated, Millions of citizens were forced to leave their homes and over 5 million, half of them children, had even to leave their country, seeking shelter in one of the 45 other member states of the Council of Europe. I'm glad to witness a concrete and clear solidarity in the whole of Europe with those who are now seeking shelter. That is heartwarming. But nevertheless, it is not enough. Much more help should be provided by our 45 member states and other states and international organizations today, tomorrow, and in the future. 
International solidarity is needed now and will be needed in the years to come as the humanitarian consequences of armed aggression will be immense and will last long. Destruction, dear friends, only take days or months. Reconstruction needs years and even decades. In April, I visited Ukraine at the invitation of the Speaker of the Ukrainian Parliament. There, I underlined the organization's solidarity with the citizens of Ukraine. Every day this war goes on means one more day of almost unbearable suffering of the Ukrainian people and a violation of fundamental rights and freedoms of millions of Europeans. That is why this war that should never have started has to stop immediately. And that is why the Russian authorities have to be held accountable for the violation of international law and a violation of fundamental human rights of the citizens of Ukraine. Our assembly expressed in its latest session at the end of April, its full support for all efforts aimed at the investigating, at investigating violations by Russia of international human rights and international humanitarian law and other international crimes, including war crimes, crimes against uh, humanity and genocide. In and ensuring the accountability of the aggressor, including through setting up an ad hoc international criminal tribunal. Such a tribunal should apply the definition of the crime of aggression as established in customary international law. It could be based in Strasbourg in view of possible synergies with the European Court of Human Rights and should have the power to issue international arrest warrants uh, and not be limited by state immunity or the immunity of heads of state and government and other state officials. At the same time, member states of the Council of Europe should support and cooperate with the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court in The Hague and make use of the universal jurisdiction to investigate and prosecute the crimes committed by the Russian army in Ukraine. Dear friends, in my opinion, Russia's unilateral war of aggression against Ukraine has shown the weakness of actual multilateralism from the United Nations and the Security Council to the OSCE, the European Union and the Council of Europe as well. They all, we all aim to prevent war and pursue peace, but altogether they, we could not prevent Russia's aggression and Ukraine's suffering. But brutal unilateralism now shown by Russia leads to nowhere, as history taught us, and only underlines the increased urgent need to structurally strengthen our European multilateral political architecture in order to better protect and promote the rule of law, respect of human rights, and the development of democracy. Therefore, I'm very glad that on the 20th of May, our ministers of foreign affairs successfully shared by your minister Luigi Di Maio agreed to organize as soon as possible a special summit of all heads of state and government of our 46 member states to discuss the future of the Council of Europe and of effective multilateralism. By now the preparation is underway and I'm keeping a close watch on it as it was the assembly, more specific, Professor Michele Nicoletti, our former president and my dear friend, who insisted already in 2017 that such a summit was unavoidable. We had to discuss multilateralism and we had to make the protection of human rights, rule of law and democracy in Europe more sustainable. The upcoming summit of heads of states and government of the Council of Europe could lead to a renewed, improved and reinforced Council of Europe with new competencies, better equipped to promote, protect and promote democratic security and embedded in a renewed and inclusive European political architecture, capable of taking more timely and effective collective actions to protect and develop rules-based multilateralism in order to be able to better deal with existing and emerging threats in Europe. Dear friends, now that the European Union is not yet capable or will, nor willing to include other European states at short notice into its structures, 
joining of the Council of Europe structures by the European Union could create a sort of pan-European Union for non-EU members, to which President Macron of France recently referred. But instead of a new union, the creation of which would cost a lot of time and it caused a lot of problems, it would be far easier and wiser to renew the Council of Europe, open to all European states. A similar move we saw at the end of the Cold War when President Mitterrand proposed a new union for former communist states. Instead of doing that, it was decided to open the Council of Europe for all these states and to make participation in the Council of Europe a precondition for joining the European Union. And so it happened, to the benefit of old and new member states of the Council of Europe and to the benefit of the European Union. To strengthen the unique protection of all European citizens by the European Convention of Human Rights, as was already stipulated in the 2008 Lisbon Treaty, the European Union must now adhere to the Convention as a matter of urgency. I already spoke about this issue with Professor, with, with uh, Commissioner Reinders of the European Union uh, in, when I was in, in Torino. This joining of the EU to the Convention would give an enormous boost to the Convention system, to the European Court of Human Rights, as well as to both the Council of Europe and the European Union and make the Council of Europe more attractive for the non-EU member states. Therefore, this issue should be on top of the upcoming summit's agenda, to my opinion. A similar effect would be created in case the EU would also accede to the European Social Charter, which formulates essential socio-economic rights of European citizens. We need to admit that the austerity policies of our member states pursued after the 2008-2009 financial crisis did a lot of harm to our social protection systems. Social economic inequalities in society have grown larger and deeper, both within and between states, and our resilience to external shocks has weakened, something that became especially visible during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our member states need to discuss in the coming summit how to structurally improve the protection and implementation of social rights and strengthen the effectiveness of the charter system, preferably with the European Union as a partner. Only if we are able to structurally mitigate social and economic inequalities, human rights, classical human rights application as such, will be able to flourish. As social rights and environmental protection go, in my opinion, hand in hand, a healthy environment is a precondition for human life. Therefore, it has to be part of all fundamental protection mechanisms, including the European Social Charter. Our assembly wants that the right to a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment should be considered as a human right by the drafting of an additional protocol to, Euro to the European Convention of Human Rights, as well as to the so European Social Charter. The upcoming summit should initiate, initiate such protocols. To champion equality and the elimination of discrimination on any grounds has to remain, in my opinion, another priority for the European human rights structure. This includes promoting the ratification and the effective implementation of groundbreaking standards and tools of the Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, also known as the Istanbul Convention. Here again, EU accession to this convention would be an important signal that the Council of Europe conventions do create a pan-European legal sphere of serious protection of fundamental human rights. Again, an issue for the summit's agenda. Dear friends, in 1949, Winston Churchill, when addressing the Parliamentary Assembly's very first session, concluded his intervention with the hope that the Council of Europe could take, and I quote, a leading and active part in the revival of the greatest of continents, which had fallen into the worst of misery, end of quote. Almost 75 years later, a revival of effective multilateralism in Europe is essential and unavoidable 
to avoid that we again fall into the worst of misery. The Russian war of aggression in Ukraine is a horrible sign on the wall, and we should not miss it. War is the most brutal violation of almost all human rights and freedoms. We therefore need a strengthened multilateralism in Europe, which can avoid new wars from happening. Being part of such a multilateralism should lead to real commitment to respect of the rule of law, human rights, and democracy, because it is in the real interest of all citizens and of the state itself. Being outside that system makes you a real outsider, lacking the many advantages of inclusion. Yes, you understand it well. This last sentence I really address to those in the Kremlin, to the president, the parliament and the government of the Russian Federation, who have made themselves now outsider of European multilateralism, which is bad for Europe, but in the end is bad for Russia and especially for the Russian citizens. Ambassador, allow me in conclusion to quote President Sergio Mattarelli. The president honored, as I said, us with his presence in our April session, and declared, and I quote, the Council of Europe is a child of the drive towards multilateralism, a drive based on an elementary consideration. Collaboration reduces opposition, counteracts conflicts, increased, is squeezing the possibility of a positive settlement of disputes. And he continued, as much as war is supposed to be a flash in the pan, although this is not the case, so much that peace is the result of the patient and unstoppable flow of the spirit and practice of collaboration between peoples, of the ability to move from confrontation and the arms race to dialogue, control, and the balance reduction of weapons of aggression. It is a laborious construction made up of coherent and continuous behaviors and choices, not of an isolated act. It is the fruit of unfailing trust in humanity and a sense of responsibility towards it. And the president concluded, if we pursue common goals in order to win, it is no longer necessary for someone else to lose. We all win together. End of quotation. Dear friends, these are fine words from a wise statesman from Italy with regard to a more effective European multilateralism with a specific role for Europe's oldest and broadest treaty-based organization, the Council of Europe. Sustainable human rights need solidarity at the national and the international level. If we are not able to organize that solidarity, we might end up, and again, I referred to uh, Churchill, in misery, where no, not the rule of law, but the rule of brutal power prevails once again. And where brutal power prevails, human rights erode and vanish. So dear friends, in my opinion, and I think it's also the opinion of our assembly, it is time to act and to act now. The upcoming Council of Europe summit initiated by uh, your Italian presidency should and could be the starting point for a more effective European multilateralism on the basis of the values of the rule of law, human rights and democracy. These were the ideas that I wanted to share with you. Uh, and of course, I'm looking forward uh, if you have any questions, remarks, comments of improvements of my idea. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, President Cox. And uh, once more, um, as on many occasions in Strasbourg, I am really impressed by the depth and the, the vision um, which inspired your intervention and which is uh, for us a certainty that uh, on the side of the parliamentary assembly, the important uh, uh, task that we are having ahead of us will be executed uh, in uh, the best possible way. And thank you very much also for the kind words uh, to the Italian presidency, which for sure uh, Mr. Alberini will convey to our authorities. Italy is often um, appreciated for uh, the individual skills. Um, on our, in other times, I would have said also in football, but for the time being, it's better not to mention Italian football. Um, but we can um, also, uh, from time to time, 
uh, be a team, uh, a good team. And I think that in, uh, during the semester of uh, the Council of Europe, uh, the team, uh, uh, the Italian team acted very, very um, proficiently and with great uh, competence. But, uh, but now, um, without prolonging uh, this, um, this um, my intervention, I would like to take advantage of the presence, uh, Mr. Cox, of one of your predecessor in our seminar, because I know that you would like uh, very much to address some words uh, to you. Mr. Nicoletti, you have the floor. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Massilli, and thanks uh, to Mr. President Cox uh, Diotini. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you here. Um, I think that uh, you made a, a great speech for our, our students and for the colleagues who are present at this uh, seminar. So thank you so much. Uh, it was so clear the, the importance and the role of multilateralism in this crisis and the press situation of Europe. And uh, on the other side, uh, the, the, the how negative and suicide is uh, the logic of unilateralism and nationalism and uh, chauvinism, uh, which is unfortunately leading some, some countries of our continent. Uh, and thank you so much for having reminded us the, the role of, uh, of the rule of law, uh, of the peace through law, the importance uh, of building uh, uh, stronger institutions, starting from the council, the, the court, and all the other multilateral institutions. I'm sure that uh, many things that you have mentioned uh, will be uh, a good opportunity for our students also to ask some questions to you, especially about the right uh, to healthy environment uh, or protection of minorities or participatory democracy and so on. I, I uh, would like just to, to emphasize the importance uh, of what you have uh, launched uh, as a kind of idea of your presidency, uh, that is uh, to use uh, the Council of Europe uh, in this uh, commitment uh, that uh, we have uh, to redefine the European and pan-European architecture uh, for now and for the future. Uh, the, the big tragedy in Ukraine and the situation of many other countries in Eastern U Europe, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, require from us a, a stronger commitment. And, and we need to, be, uh, to use more creativity in finding the right solution. Uh, we cannot just say no. Uh, as the European Union sometimes says, uh, we need to, to have something more to offer as a concrete instrument of solidarity for these countries uh, which are fighti fighting uh, not only for their life and independence, but for being European. Uh, and so I, I, I would like to, to, to support uh, your idea and also to, to tell you that our institutions, both uh, the University of Trento and the CESPI in Rome, are, are fully available to, to offer you some reflections, maybe organizing a seminar or something like that. Uh, the, the European Union has been thinking over the future of, uh, of the Union for a couple of years, and maybe we can start a reflection on the future of the Council of Europe involving uh, universities, research centers, and so on. And this would be uh, a, a good challenge uh, for all of us, uh, building together uh, the pan-European uh, architecture uh, of the future. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, President Cox. Uh, and uh, good luck uh, for, for your important uh, work uh, in, in, in the Council of Europe. Thank you, Michele. And now we are um, entering uh, um, the last but not uh, less important part of our seminar, namely um, the debate um, with the students. I remind that um, we have uh, uh, three or four different groups of students connected uh, from Sarajevo, from Germany, 
and from Italy, uh, Merano and Trento. So um, I was told to uh, collect uh, three or four questions in order to uh, present them to our uh, guests. And then, um, of course, it, it will be possible probably to have uh, more rounds of questions. I, I remember that we have set uh, 3.30 as possible end of our seminar. So we have 20 minutes left uh, and that, that should allow uh, students uh, to, to ask uh, uh, a, good, uh, a good number of, of questions. So I will uh, pass the floor to the first uh, students uh, who will be ready to ask uh, uh, their question to our guests. I can see um, the first question. Would yeah, you like I can, to do it? I so, can see Winfried Engeser um, from Germany raising a hand. I have, I have a written question. question. I have a written question for President Cox. Perhaps we can uh, start by that written question. Um, President Cox, uh, the question is the following What are the Council further plans of actions? regarding the Russian Federation. Will there be more uh, attempts of at diplomacy or will sanctions and weapons deliveries be continued and perhaps even intensified? Alexander Gauthier and others. Thank you, Mr. Gons. Thank you very much for that, um, for that question. Um, the Council of Europe has excluded Russia because it's blatant violation of its international obligations. As I said, membership of the Council of Europe and of European multilateralism is not for free. At the same time, we realize that this is doing so much harm to the 140 uh, million inhabitants of the Russian Federation who will no longer be under the protection of the European Convention of Human Rights. So. That is why we call on the Russian authorities, the president, the government, and the parliament of the Russian Federation to step down from their uh, unilateralist approach of um, uh, what they think that is a problem in Ukraine. This is only doing harm, not only to Europe, but also to the Russia and the Russian citizens. Uh, as soon as Russia is prepared to return to multilateralism instead of brutal uh, uh, unilateralism, uh, we will be able and willing to listen to that. The Council of Europe is not a sanctions mechanism. We are not the European Union. We are in an agora, a platform of uh, 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 interparliamentary uh, dialogue. But of course, we cannot have a dialogue with a country that says, whatever we agree, whatever you say, we are entitled to unilaterally uh, act in a military way if things are not as we want them to be. At the same time, the assembly has decided that we will stay into contact with human rights defenders, uh, human rights defenders, uh, critical uh, journalists, um, uh, uh, NGOs in in the, in the Russian Federation, and give them entrance to all our. Uh, premises. Um, uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the upcoming June session, I have invited from Belarus, who takes side in this uh, conflict with, uh, with, uh, with Russia, I have invited Madam Tikhanovskaya, the leader of the uh, Belarusian opposition, to come and address our assembly to make clear that those who want that also Russia develops in a more democratic way and Belarus now they are welcome and we, we take care of them. But once again, we can not discuss with a government that says whatever you think, whatever you say, whatever our obligations are, we do what we want. That is a clear signal to, uh, to Russia. And I'm quite sure that our decision to expel them as the only international organization that did so, that signal was received in the Kremlin loud and clear. They know by now, that there is a price to pay if you if you yourself walk away from uh, European multilateralism and a system of human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. I hope that answers your question, sir. Thank you. 
Mrs. Ferrari. Uh, Adeline. Uh, Adeline. Winfried, you raise the hand if you want to. Winfried Engere. Yeah. Hello. Uh, hello. Um, I'm I'm not uh, actually a student, but uh, I'm uh, a teacher uh, of uh, from Sonthofen, and actually um, my students uh, were about to ask exactly the same question as Alexander. Did. Uh, so I don't really know why my students are not able to um, mm. uh, to speak or to to get, uh, to have a word in this uh, conference. I don't really know, but uh, really our question has already been answered in a way. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have Madalena Gay. Madalena J. Hi, I'm Madalena. I'm from Franco, the Leonardo da Vinci. HL. Helen uh, Cox, you about the need to champion equality. However, as a woman and as a European citizen, I believe that the word equity and justice must also be the center of attention in European societies to grant equal access to tools and opportunities. Otherwise, equality may not be fully achieved. My question is, do you think that after accomplishing the welfare state in the country, Europe will be able to adapt its policies and advance towards full equity and justice? For whom is the question, Madalena? If uh, um, after accomplishing the welfare state, Europe will be able to adapt its policies and advance towards full equity and justice. I think it's for President Cox. Oh. Yes. Okay. President Cox. Thank you very much, Madalena. If I understood you well, you said that the, you talk about uh, 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 inequality in, uh, in, 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 in the country of Europe member states. And what are you going to do to uh, create equality? That is indeed such a an example that in, in our European Convention on Human Rights, we guarantee our member states, our governments, our parliaments guarantee yeah. equality to, uh, to all of our citizens. But there is a big gap between what we promise and what we deliver. So this is still work in progress. And the bad news is, if I, ha I have to say that, that due to recent crisis, uh, the financial crisis, but also the COVID crisis, and now the crisis in, 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 in Ukraine, equality is not uh, 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 diminishing, but is growing. The same signals came from the, uh, the OSCD, uh, the, the, the International Economic Think Tank that is related to the Council of Europe, that it described that inequality is growing. And as I said in my intervention, that as long as we are not able to mitigate inequality in Europe, we do not really um, give access to all citizens to their fundamental rights and freedoms. Uh, if we do not respect fundamental and essential, minimal uh, social economic rights, it is not doable to really take advantage of your classical uh, rights and, and, and freedoms. And you also referred, Madalena, to the position of women. Of course, we still see that although we say that all citizens in Europe are equal and should be treated equal in equal circumstances, we see that, for example, payment of women uh, is far below uh, the, the, the average payment. That is clear discrimination of women. On the other hand, we see that violence against women especially in the, late, in the latest years, also in COVID times, did not uh, decrease, but did increase. And there is more violence against women, and this violence is against them because they are female. That is a complete discrimination of half of our, our citizens. So, yes, um, we grant a lot of, uh, of rights in our European Convention, but in practice, we do deliver very badly. And this should also be discussed by our governments. Put your money where your mouth is. If you say that you guarantee equal rights, then do it. Uh, otherwise, do not promise it. I hope that answers your question, Magdalena. 
Yes, thank you very much. President Cox, I was able to delete a, a, a question from a student, but I uh, remember the sense of it, and uh, it's the following. Um, of course, the uh, Council of Europe uh, um, is based uh, on the uh, pan-European continent uh, uh, territory, and so it's mainly concerned with um, um, defense and um, respect of human rights, uh, in the European continent. But what can the Council of Europe do uh, when those uh, human rights are violated in other continents, uh, for instance, in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia? Which kind of action can, uh, can, it, um, can it take? Thank you on his behalf. Thank you very much for that, uh, for that question. Um, let me first say that it's, of course, first and foremost to the citizens, to the politicians and to the governments and the parliaments of, for example, Latin America, to guarantee the same rights to their citizens as we in Europe do to our citizens. Uh, but of course, the Council of Europe can be of help. I hope to, in the very near future, to meet with the presidency of Parlatino, which is the so you can say the equivalent of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, but then for Latin, uh, Latin America. We have a cooperation agreement with the Palatino um, uh, uh, Interparliamentary uh, Assembly, in, uh, which is based, I think, in, in, in Panama. Um, and of course, many of our conventions, although they are developed in Europe, are open for others. For example, the Istanbul Convention is a convention that can be signed by other countries. I know that Mexico is in a, in a, uh, already far on the way to become, to adhere to the Istanbul Convention to protect uh, women against uh, violence. Uh, and the same uh, is possible for other, uh, other states outside uh, the Council of Europe. Many more of our conventions, for example, the convention that we are now updating that is the Convention on Data Protection is open uh, to be signed by uh, other countries. Here we even hope that the European Union and the United States of America will adhere to that convention. In that way we can not only create a, one legal sphere in the whole of Europe but also uh, worldwide. Um, I think the Istanbul Convention is now the gold standard with regard to protection of uh, women against uh, violence. We want uh, we want to communicate to other, other parts of the world, feel free to join that convention. But if you join it, it also gives you obligations. M membership of a convention here again is not for free. You have to take care that if you put your signature under such a convention that you deliver. And that is a, one of the weak parts of our Council of Europe, uh, uh, monitoring of, uh, uh, of the fa of facts, uh, monitoring whether member states do what they promise is, is, uh, is, uh, should be further developed. But uh, in, 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 um, in um, a recent report that was adopted by the assembly with an overwhelming majority, I had the honor to draft it. It says that the Council of Europe should not only co cooperate with the countries that are in our geographical neighborhood, but also that are in our political neighborhood. And if you see recent developments in Latin America, it becomes very interesting to see if and how both continents can cooperate under the same umbrella of promoting and protection of the rule of law, uh, uh, human rights and democracy. So yes, we are open for uh, cooperation with other parts of the world and it's already functioning. Thank you very much again for the question. Thank you, President. Um, any more questions? I think we can take a couple more. Uh, I have a question. Um, I'm from uh, Germany, Sandhofen. Um, first of all, thank you for your um, speech. It was really um, good. And our question is, um, there have been uh, crimes against humanity in Ukraine, killing of hundreds of civilians, especially in Butchka, close to Kiev. And my uh, question is, what role will the Council of Europe play um, taking Russia in front of the court and collecting evidence in Ukraine? President Cox. 
I think the question was directed to you. Yeah, thank you very much for that most important question. As I said in my intervention, in my speech, that one of the obligations that we as Council of Europe have with regard to our former member state, uh, uh, Russia, which is, by the way, until September under the European Convention of Human Rights and still can be held accountable for what it is doing under that convention. But we also have to take care that international law is respected and there where it's not respected that the Russian authorities and the Russian military are hold accountable. That can be done in, in, in different ways. It can, of course, be done by the prosecutor general of Ukraine itself, because you, he, uh, in this case, she has the jurisdiction over what is happening in Ukraine. And we all see the atrocities that have happened. As I said, I visited uh, Ukraine at the invitation of the Speaker of the Parliament, and I was well informed about the atrocities that have taken place and do take place until this very day. The Council of Europe has offered support via its Secretary General uh, to help the Prosecutor uh, 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 General uh, in, in Ukraine to do her work. The other thing that we can do, and we have called upon our member states to use their universal jurisdiction to um, take up crimes, uh, war crimes and crimes uh, against humanity. That's a universal jurisdiction. So in the Netherlands, in Italy, uh, a prosecutor general can uh, act on uh, against those who have uh, uh, have been involved in, in, in crimes uh, on these bases in, in, in Ukraine. And the third, then the third thing is that, of course, uh, we call uh, and we, we call up, uh, upon member states to cooperate with the International Criminal Court and its prosecutor general in The Hague, in my, here in the city where I am now, uh, to, uh, to prosecute crimes against humanity, perhaps genocide, uh, war crimes. Uh, and the Council of Europe has offered already its support to uh, the International Criminal Court to see how we can be of help to get justice done. And the fourth and last uh, uh, part of this, um, uh, to answer this question is that our parliamentary assembly has called in its last meeting in, in, uh, in April in, in, in Strasbourg uh, for the creation of an international uh, tribunal that could deal with the crime of aggression. Uh, the crime of aggression is, uh, uh, is, is mentioned in, 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 in customary international law, but it's not easy for the International Criminal Court to deal with it. So uh, a special uh, international tribunal could perhaps be of help in this respect. And as I said, this could be based in Strasbourg because it has uh, relations with what the Council of, of, what the Council of Europe's European uh, uh, Court of Human Rights is doing. But uh, these are the four possibilities for the Council of Europe to really help uh, Ukraine and Europe that justice is done. It has to be clear to each and everyone, from the, from the youngest soldier to the president of the Russian Federation, that nobody will, be, uh, uh, will enjoy immunity when it comes to these horrible crimes uh, to the citizens of Ukraine. They all will be held accountable for what they are doing now. That has to be clear. And we have seen in other countries, there are uh, students from Bosnia who are, uh, uh, are participating in this, this, uh, this seminar. We have seen that also with regards to crimes committed in Bosnia, in the end, at, to a certain level, justice was done, uh, amongst others, by an international tribunal in The Hague. I hope that answers your question from Germany. Thank you, President Cox. Our time is already over, but I would like to ask you, President Cox, a last effort, if you agree, um, answering the last question we can take due to the uh, time constraint. Uh, my it, question would be... It's, how... uh, sorry, there is one from Benjamin from Bosnia, because oh, Bosnia was we, mentioned... We, we take, uh, we yeah. take Bosnia. We take the yeah, Bosnia. okay, so of from course, Sarajev, course, from sorry. our project. Sorry. Okay. Beyond regions and okay. borders. Okay, so uh, good day to everybody. Uh, good day to everybody. It's 
first I want to say my name is Benjamin. I'm a student from Sarajevo. And first I want to say that I'm really happy to have the possibility to participate in this. And I have a, have a question for President Cox. So my question is, when you talked about the situation in, in Ukraine, you know, and you mentioned that the way to prevent wars from happening is, um, is a good multilateral relation. Uh, well, it made me think about my country, Bosnia and Herzegovina, because the, when we had a war 30 years ago, it was, a, it was a war including many things about religion and nationalities. And, but today, after it finished, those people still, uh, still the people who are on, the, on, on different sides, still live really close to each other, like friends, like neighbors. We still live all together here, although everything, many bad things happen in the war. Uh, and I, I consider that to be the greatest treasure of my country, that culture of coexistence. But my question is, uh, in countries such as, as Bosnia, for, for example, which are, su which are such a mix of different religions and nations, do you think that it is possible uh, for, for the multi, multi uh, for the, for the, um, for the diplomatic way of solving problems to be a part of, uh, of inner awareness of coexistence, or there has to be a higher level of coexistence in an in international level. So do you think that uh, it is possible to sustain peace only by uh, a culture of coexistence inside a country, only by the awareness of people? Or do you think that there still has to exist uh, a higher authority on an international level as an extra safety for, for peace? President Cox. Thank you for that question from Sarajevo, a city that I love very much. I have been the rapporteur for the Council of Europe's Parliamentary Assembly for quite a period. And I also was um, asked, I think, twice to chair election observations in, the, in your beautiful country. And indeed, I agree with you. Um, if you meet with ordinary citizens, young and old of your country, you it is hard to imagine that uh, peaceful cooperation is not possible in your country because sitting on a ter terrace in, uh, in, uh, in, in Banja Luka or in Sarajevo or, uh, or uh, in, in which other beautiful place of your country, you can communicate with everyone. But we see that at the same time, there is a constant, const, uh, constant threat of this uh, coexistence and this living together also due to political um, um, how would I say it in a, in a nice way <laughs> incapabilities to really uh, lead Bosnia towards a more sustainable uh, more reliable more peaceful future uh, and that also brings me to the other part of your question uh, can can Bosnia can the Bosnian citizens do it by them own, their own? No. First and foremost, they have to do it by their own. It's their country. It's your country. But at the same time, uh, you are not an island. You are living in a in a, in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in a challenging world. So if there is no uh, effective multilateralism in the whole of Europe, it is quite difficult to have a, a kind of effective uh, multilateralism between the communities in, uh, in your country and between the citizens in your country. Um, uh, I am aware that, for example, the president of the Republika Srpska is not quite helpful to, uh, to say it mildly, to develop coexistence in, in, in your country, but also the involvement of, for example, the Russian Federation is, sorry, this is, <laughs> this is the Dutch uh, Senate bell. <laughs> I have to leave for a for a meeting, but it will stop. Uh, that that uh, uh, what is happening in Bosnia has a lot to do with what is happening in the in the neighborhood. One of the things that the Council of Europe, uh, I think, is absolutely obliged to do is to cast a very close eye on, especially the Western Balkans. We now talk about how we could not prevent the war in Ukraine. I do hope that we never have to talk again about why we could not prevent another war in the Western Balkans. And as you know, you, your questions show that it is not the citizens who are there to make a new war, but the political system and the lack of cooperation inside your country 
and between the countries of the Western Balkan and uh, the failure of uh, multilateralism at this moment in the whole of Europe makes me as a born optimist sometimes very pessimistic about uh, the, the, the great risks that your citizens have in your country to become again, <coughs> sorry, to become again part of something that we did, did not want to happen ever again, a new war in Bosnia-Herzegovina or in its, uh, in its neighborhood. So yes, you need cooperation at home uh, that cannot be enforced from abroad. You have to do it by yourself but you also can only develop yourself in a sustainable way if you live in a peaceful surroundings and therefore international European effective multilateralism is more needed than ever. That's why the Russian unilateralism is so bad for Russia, for Ukraine and for the rest of Europe. And that multilateralism is not uh, a nice thing. It's absolutely and unavoidable if we want to avoid in the words of Churchill that we again fall into the worst of misery. That would be the worst thing that could happen to us. I hope that answers your question, although it's not completely optimistic, my answer this time. Thank you, President Cox. And uh, the bell has shown that you are requested from your colleagues in another um, capacity. So I would like to, to put an end uh, quite on time to the seminar. I would like to thank all participants for the high level of their uh, interventions for sure was a very enriching uh, debate uh, i also appreciate the presence of um, our students and as a concluding remark uh, i'm sure that for all of us engaged in your rights uh, times ahead will not be easy uh, we don't we will not have uh, i think uh, uh, time to relax very um, completely as we would wish but um, our, I think, uh, um, wish is that in um, uh, due time we can detect uh, a sort of light uh, uh, after the tunnel uh, that uh, gives us uh, some, some, some uh, possibility of uh, constructing ahead uh, um, something more concrete and something more, let's say, also important that we were able to do until now. So thank you once again to all of you. And uh, I really appreciate moderating this debate. And I hope until uh, next opportunity to, to meet uh, each other again. Thank you.